Where is he? Denny, call security. Where's your grandson, Denny? I don't have to tell you anything. Yeah, you do. Ugh, damn. Okay, here we go. Bad Lieutenant. Um, man, where do I start? This, um, well, okay, we'll, we'll try from the beginning. Right now, I'm working on about an hour and a half sleep. So, I came across this movie, well, the spin-off New Orleans version, while scrolling through Amazon a couple weeks ago looking for a movie, right? And Bad Lieutenant Poor Call New Orleans was in a listing for recommended stuff. And at first glance, it looked like complete trash. Like, I think we're all aware of Nicolas Cage's thing of doing a lot of crappy action movies in the past 10 years or so. Which really, I mean, you look at the posters and it really shares the same vibe. But I looked into it and the only reason I clicked play was because to my surprise it was directed by the legendary Werner Herzog. That man is a god in the world of filmmaking, in my eyes at least, and I worship him. I've seen a majority of his mainline movies and documentaries, so this took me by surprise. Because up until then, this totally flew by under my radar. And also, yes, he's that guy from Mandalorian in season 1. I would like to see the baby. But then I learned that this was actually a spin-off remake, whatever this is, of the original starring Harvey Keitel, which came out in 1992. So naturally, I went back and watched the original to compare and contrast, and uh... Yeah, totally different. But since they share the same vibe, I want to talk about these two together. However, they are two completely different tones, those being the key word, and I'll get back to that at the end. So let me give you a quick summary about this franchise as a whole. The original 1992 film, simply titled Bad Lieutenant, was a story written by Zoe Lund and directed by Abel Ferreira. The sequel or reboot, however this is called, the Herzog version, has no canon relation to the 92 film in any way except for the moniker of Bad Lieutenant. In fact, Herzog stated having never actually seen the original before starting his version. I've never seen the other film, and I think it, it was wise. And of course, I, I know about the story of the other film, and I was told uh, this has nothing whatsoever to do with the previous film. Which is very odd, given his previous works in comparison with his Nosferatu reboot, since that was rooted in his love and appreciation for the original back in 1922. And in fact, Herzog's version was initially going to be simply called Bad Lieutenant, but had Port Called New Orleans added to distinguish the film from the original, since they didn't share any continuity. And there was actually a lot of pushback from the original's director in the making of Herzog's remake. But the 92 and 09 versions do not share the same character. The title really captures the only similarity between the two with their state and corruption. And that's an accurate title, these are very bad lieutenants. And it's not even the rough and tough borderline vigilante type, it's just straight up crime. Please. Please don't now make listen me to me, it. Ronaldo. I dumped a lot of money this year on you. I got a chance to get some of that back. I want to take advantage of it. These guys are bad news. This makes the whole rule bending that Batman's known for look like humanitarian work in comparison. I'm not wearing hockey pants. Herzog's rendition definitely portrays a more anti-hero aesthetic with Cage's character. He's seen having some redemptive qualities in the beginning and end. Somewhat. Doing. What? So there shouldn't be any major spoilers with this because I do think you really need to see this for yourself if you're up for it. It's a unique pairing and my goal here is to kind of just prepare you for what you're going into. But let me preface by saying that one, these are not for the faint of heart and two, they are not feel good movies. Now, let's start with the one that hurled me down this fucking roller coaster of madness. Bad Lieutenant Port Called New Orleans stars everybody's favorite, Nicolas Cage, playing Terrence McDonough. The film is primarily set in his eyes. He's a detective working on solving a murder case, but know that this is not the sole focus of the movie. It's to drive the plot forward, but that's about all it serves. The intention lies in the study of Cage's character. Terrence is hooked on just about every drug you can think of by the end of the movie. You still have problems with your back. You take medication for it? Only what the doctor prescribes. And he does everything you could think of as someone with his level of power and influence to feed his addiction. And he's not ashamed to rope people into his methods either. From extorting drug dealers and skimming off from the evidence room, there's no line he won't cross. But that's just with drugs. When it comes to carrying out his job, he's just as bad. Especially when being pushed in a corner, all that self-medication drives him off the deep end. It is amazing to see what he does and watch him get away with so much of it too. And actually, now that I think about it, the description kind of falls into a similar territory of how Patrick Bateman in American Psycho plays out. Substitute the obsession with murder for drugs and it's not that far off. 
And since this is from Terrence's perspective, we also see what happens when he begins to hallucinate from his addiction too. What are these fucking iguanas doing on my coffee table? They ain't no iguana. Those moments are, admittedly, a bit of a clash tonally with some of the scenes it's included in, but perhaps my favorite image he sees <laughs> is the soul of a corpse he'd recently been an accomplice to murdering start to breakdance. The soul still dancing. <laughs> I know, it's fucking wild. The whole movie isn't an acid trip though, it's more like a slow descent into madness. The anchor that really holds him in place here is his girlfriend Frankie, played by Ava Mendes. She's the heart to replace Terrence's lack of a conscience. She's the one that brings him back from the edge of complete despair. And her conflicts in the movie serve as an additional B-plot to Terrence's arc. Now, there are several threads going on in the movie at once and sometimes can get a little difficult to keep track of. Oh, and did I mention that Terrence is a degenerate gambling addict too? I know, right? It just keeps piling on. That's right. To keep this discussion from going off the rails, I'm going to try mostly focusing on Terrence. Watching this is like going on a ride at Six Flags where you don't know how it ends. I'll admit that I have a hard time watching things in one sitting, especially with longer movies, but once this movie started, it kept me seated from beginning to end. And no bathroom breaks, I swear to god, I didn't even feel the runtime. It made me wonder during the second viewing why this is so interesting, because on a first watch, the engagement is in the shock of Terrence's crimes. You don't know who he is or why he's such a bent cop, but you begin to see those sparks explaining a bit of his reasoning the more it's played out, even while his crimes gradually worsen until the very end, at the same time, the movie is also humanizing him. It's a very odd balance that, for being as insane as this movie is, to me was definitely the most intriguing aspect of Port Call of New Orleans. He is someone willing to do anything to nab the guy he's after, and he's a terrifying force to be reckoned with. Like, he straight up just pulls a gun on an elderly woman in order to extract the information that he needs. What's such an ironic thing about that and between him planting evidence and blackmailing is that it actually works. Like what the fuck? While there's guys in his unit that are aware of some of his methods, it's not like they adamantly support him, it's more like they just don't question it because his actions, while totally illegal and immoral, work to serve the cases and himself. Terrence is both a believer of the ends justify the means sentiment, but also he just doesn't care anymore. His drug usage has whittled away his ability to wage or risks anymore, and it gets him into some really hot water. This movie is absolutely worth watching just for Nicolas Cage's performance. The same can be said for a lot of the movies he's in, honestly, even when he's batshit insane. And I mean, when is he not? Yes. His face. Oh. Like, his transitions from being a pill popper to just straight up smoking crack and meth is, is so good. And that's it, I can't think of a better word to describe that. It's not even with makeup, his movements, mannerisms, and speech changes. Cage does such a great job in replicating those signs of being an addict. Which I think a lot of that can be also attributed to his work in Leaving Las Vegas, and that's totally a movie I'm going to be talking about in the future, trust me. Of course, a lot of that comes from Werner Herzog's direction as well, and his influence is really what makes it such a drastic change from the original. With the interviews he did for the movie, he talks about trying to really hone in on that tone bordering between the demented and surreal. He was actually the one responsible for inserting the crazy hallucination sequences, and he even filmed them himself, which, uh, yeah, it's definitely more of an amateur feel, which I'm not really sure was a good idea. In any case, with Cage's acting and Herzog's direction, it's definitely a memorable experience, despite his claim that this was completely different from the original, and again, him having never seen it. As I talk about the 1992 version, we're going to see just how truthful that was. Port Call of New Orleans is an entertaining and gut-wrenching ride, and all I'll say about the ending is that, at least in this version, the Bad Lieutenant has a mostly definitive arc. Take that as you will, you'll have to see it for yourself to understand, but for sure, if you're up for it and want a precursor to watching the original, then I actually would recommend seeing this first. Okay, okay, this is... We're going to the Shadow Realm. Okay. Fuck you, Pegasus! 1992 was a year that a movie came out called Bad Lieutenant, and it's, uh, it's fucked. In fact, it was actually kind of a pain to find clips to show about this, because most of them are the lieutenant getting high, or just stuff that I'm honestly just hesitant to show, period. Now, this isn't the most disturbing movie I've ever seen, but just to put into perspective, I would rather watch Requiem for a Dream three times back to back than have to sit through this again. That's not to say it's bad, no, no, no. It's not even the stuff that happens, really, it's the inflection and performance of Keitel and the writing which comes off so cold and heartless. That sounds like an oxymoron, but really for what it does and what it's trying to capture, it does an amazing job at it. It's very cruel, like, I've never experienced the feeling of a movie itself giving me the cold shoulder before. Everything that the 92 Bad Lieutenant has is in like a fuck you to the audience. It really feels like it doesn't want you to watch it. It's so unique, but that's what I hate and love about it though. It's that classic watching a train wreck show event. 
This movie is a void, a borderline inhuman antagonist of a lead whose only focus is in self-satisfaction. The Herzog version at least had a love interest and had some people Terrence cared about to some extent. Cattell's lieutenant has kids, but with his interaction it's abundantly clear he's as emotionally distant as he can be. And I keep referring to him with the actor's name because he doesn't even have a name in the movie, he's just a lieutenant. Which is honestly perfect, that's how distant from having a conscience this guy has. There's a lack of his identity. He's a broken, seemingly irredeemable man. It could be argued differently with the ending, but it's clear that to his core he is cemented in his ways. The plot to this movie, in all honesty, is really not that much different than Port Call New Orleans. It's the same setup, major drug problem, gambler, working on a big case and lots of little side plots and events to showcase Keitel's insanity. Except if you've seen the Herzog one, imagine that dialed up from 8 to like a 50. Yeah, oh but take out the iguanas and breakdancing cause there's not an ounce of humor to this unless you just enjoy human suffering. Endless suffering. Yeah. There is one hallucination scene in the third act but it is anything but funny. All the vices that Cage's Terrence had is a much bigger problem with Keitel's. His drug problem becomes such an issue that for most of the third act he's barely able to speak in coherent sentences. There's nothing keeping him from hitting rock bottom. There's also a much heavier emphasis of sex in this as well, the big case Keitel has to work on is in relation to that too, and I'm just warning you about that going in because there's some really strong content in this. He's completely unlikable. I don't think I've seen anyone say that they enjoyed their time watching the lieutenant as a character, because really he's just that far gone. There was a point where I kind of forgot he was even a cop altogether, and Keitel's performance absolutely sells that. I love him in Reservoir Dogs, but his work in this took the title. I think it's the best thing he's ever done, really. Now, all that stuff about him being inhuman still stands for me, but there's a very interesting angle to this that I was not expecting with everything that happens in between. Surprisingly, he experiences guilt. It's probably the second most intense emotion we see from the lieutenant next to anger. And because of that, I really felt that this version had a more realistic feel than the New Orleans one. I know all that sounds so weird, like, you're just sure he's devoid of emotion and feeling. Yes. That's the impression he gives, and when he's in that state committing the crimes, it really feels like he does, but you know he's still human. And I think the satisfying angle to this is in seeing his suffering. While again, like Terrence, he gets away with a lot of the terrible things he does, and to me they are way worse in comparison to Terrence, but it's also the most human. We don't get the same level of guilt with Terrence as we do with Keitel. The lieutenant is genuinely suffering from his actions. And yeah, a lot of that might be because of the hole he's dug himself. And there's an argument that his desperation is the only reason we see that from him. Like you're not sorry, you're just sorry you got caught kind of a thing. And I could get behind that too, there's a lot of room for interpretation here. But that's what makes the lieutenant so intriguing. You hate to see what he does but you can't help but enjoy studying him. I mentioned with New Orleans about Terrence having an arc and, despite these movie similarities, Keitel doesn't honestly have one. If he does, and I know where it might be, but it's just so subtle that I don't even know if it matters. I'm wondering how spoilers here, I need to be careful. because. The ending for the 92 one is just so bleak and matter of fact, it leaves you with a terrible feeling. If you go see this, go watch some classic Pixar movies for real cause you're not going to want to go to bed with the bad lieutenant being the last thing on your mind. I might have given the impression of Keitel not having a distinct arc as a negative, but I don't think having one altogether is necessarily a bad thing. There's a few movies I can think of and even animes where that's the case. First ones that come to my mind are like Johnny Depp in Black Mass and Light Yagami from Death Note. It works if your lead is compelling enough on their own, and the lieutenant is certainly that. You keep watching to see how bad it really gets, that's the hook. The setting to this too is also just so much grimier, every frame feels completely decrepit and filthy. A lot of the footage they took in the city was actually done guerrilla style, no permits or anything. For working with only a budget of 1 million dollars at the time, the production and camera guys did a really great job capturing that vibe. Bottom line, watch both, seriously, they're great movies. Kind of on the low end in rewatchability, the 92 one is like a once a year watch, if that. It's like how often do you watch Cannibal Holocaust, seriously, who's watching that every week? Shut the fuck up. Even though New Orleans is much more rewatchable and entertaining than the 92 Bad Lieutenant, Ferreira's version is in my opinion still a superior film. I don't know when I'll see it again, it'll be a long time, I'll tell you that much. Give me like 6 months to try and recover and forget about it and then we'll talk. If you're wanting to see it, then they're both on Amazon if you have a subscription, certainly give them a go, when you're ready, at least. Kind of mentally prepare yourself for the 92 one especially. Okay guys, thank you for watching. This one came out a lot quicker because I already had the template done after seeing New Orleans. After watching it, I was like, I have to do a video on this. 
Originally it was just going to be Herzog's movie, but I kind of wanted to take a chance doing a double feature project like this. Kind of reach out of my comfort zone a little bit. A uh, couple things I wanted to mention, I am including some links to my social media outlets. If you guys are interested, please take a look. Alright guys, you're awesome. Please take care, and also I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on this if you've seen either of these already. Especially the Kaitel movie, like what's your guys' take on that? See ya.